Uh, please check your email for the Zoom meeting that we will have after the talk, okay? And let us all welcome back Deacon Bill Knight. Deacon Bill? Thank you for being here. Can everybody hear me? Very good. I'm not used to this, so bear with me. Let's all bow our heads in prayer, placing ourselves in the presence of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, through the obedience of Jesus, you are the only source of health and healing. In you there is calm and the only true peace in the universe. Grant to each one of us, your children, an awareness of your presence and give us perfect confidence in you. In all pain and weariness and anxiety, teach us to yield ourselves to your never failing care, knowing that your love and power surrounds us, trusting in your wisdom and providence to give us health and strength and peace when your time is best. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So, like previous sessions we've had together, you have three pieces um, of paper before you. One was a little kind of a little pre-course review. I don't expect anybody to be able to answer all of those questions, but at least to get you thinking a little bit. And then the second thing is you'll have a blue sheet of paper of anointing of the sick. And the first section that we'll cover tonight is about anointing of the sick. This, this article was actually written um, by a bishop and has been uh, received the imprimatur. And it kind of breaks down um, the teachings that I give you tonight, but a little more in depth. And it, everything that we learn in any session or presentation, we have to do more digging in. There is not a time that I don't learn something new, even sitting down and preparing lesson plans for a session such as this. And then, of course, there's another section with the slides that you're going to see tonight. The other thing I might tell you, anointing of the sick, as well as um, penance or, and confession, are all very closely related. So you're going to hear me going bouncing back and forth between those two. The other session that I normally would present before these two pieces, which is now going to be in the next two sessions, is the Ten Commandments, which allows us to kind of take a look at ourselves and see how we're doing as disciples of Christ. So first off is the anointing of the sick. Anointing the sick is unlike any other form of religious anointing. Any other form of religious anointing. Now, what are some of the ways that we see religious anointing other than anointing of the sick? Hmm? Baptism, confirmation, ordination. So these are all things that we would see which are anointing, but they are not, are not anointing of the sick. The other term you're going to see come up is unction. Anybody ever heard the word extreme unction? It's not a bad thing to say. It's not commonly used anymore. We are encouraged to use a different terminology because it actually has a deeper meaning than what most of us think it does. But unction was an older term that was used to have the same meaning as anointing of the sick. So it kind of changed over a period of time, and then we've changed that with Vatican II. Anointing of the sick is benefited for a sick person. Other religious anointing occurs in other sacraments that we've already discussed, baptism, confirmation, uh, bab uh, baptism, and um, I, I doubled up on that, and ordination. We also see anointing in the coronation of monarchs. Okay. There's a deep historical content in this. The Roman Catholic Church uses the name anointing of the sick beginning in 1972. That's the end of Vatican II when they, when they developed the new Roman Missal at that point. 
and we began to use the, the uh, 1972 missile to define it. The earlier term of unction of the sick or extreme unction has absolutely the same meaning. So don't ever let anybody tell you that's the wrong term to me to use. It's just that the common term that we use is anointed the sick. But extreme unction still exists. But it does, like I said, have a deeper meaning. It's the term extreme unction was the normal name for the sacrament in the West from the 12th century until 1972. Other names over that period of time have also included unction or blessing of consecrated oil, the unction of God, and the office of unction. So we can see just through generic change, language has changed, and the name changes, but the sacrament remains the same. The community of Christ Church uses the term administration of the sick, or administration to the sick. And we'll see other non-Catholic faiths will use anointing of the sick, but they use it in different meaning, and they don't look at it as a sacrament. Like you said, since 1972, the Roman Catholic Church has used the name of the anointing of the sick, both in its English translations by the Holy See and all of its official documents in Latin. It does not forbid the use of other names. Um, like I said, the older term, unction of the extreme, uh, sick or extreme unction. This is to emphasize that the sacrament is available and it's recommended to all those who are suffering from any serious illness and to dispel the common misconception that is, it is exclusively, exclusively for those who are near death. Very common in early times of the church for someone to wait till the last bloody moment. Okay? That's not what the church wants. The church wants, at the time that you feel that there's an illness that you need the Lord's assistance, that's the time to seek it. Okay? Now, we can go back to scriptural references, and they're, they're right here listed for you on your, on your slide sheet there. And the scriptural references are, oops. Well, we're going to back up here. So what of the last rites? The term last rites refers to the administration of anointing to a dying person. Okay. Uh, last rites has got three different parts to it which is not something you really need to remember, but it's a good thing to know, okay? The term also refers to the sacrament of penance and Holy Communion. And when Holy Communion is ministered to those who are dying, it's known as viaticum, okay? Which is a word that means provision for the journey. So you're receiving Christ as food for the journey, provision for the journey. So what we see is the normal order. If Father Ed gets called to administer last rites, anointing of the sick, extreme unction, whatever we desire to call it, then the normal order of administration would be first penance or confession. Okay, If the dying person is physically able to confess, if they are. Often they are not, but if they are. Then absolution, forgiveness, and then condition, depending on the condition or the existence of the contrition is given. So they're not capable of doing a whole lot, maybe a short prayer or whatever. Then anointing and then viaticum. So anointing with the oils and then food for the journey. It was very common in my last parish because I had a very elderly uh, priest. We would go and he would hear confession and then I would go in. He would, we would do anointing. He would do the anointing. I would assist him and then I would give the, the patient viaticum or food for the journey. So you can see the beauty in that, but that's, that's for the extremes. Anybody who is uh, suffering any kind of illness should seek anointing of the sick before this time comes if they can. Make sense? Yes. I'm sorry? 
Yes. And that's because of the terminology. But often, often, a lot, uh, the priests went to the hospitals, these uh, different care centers, and they did just exactly what we're talking about there. Again, it's terminology. And what happens, we all know that words and language change over time. I think I mentioned that previously. You know, I think back when, when I was a child, if uh, I didn't like something, I would say it was bad, bad music. Can't stand it, bad music. And along comes my children, the youngest now 32, I hate to admit that, and she would say bad, that meant good music. You know, so language changes, meaning, but the meaning is still the same. And so they may not have said anointing of the sick, but it was exactly the same thing. Just we've modernized the term with Vatican II. No, you did not. And, and, and it's not a common misconception. You did not have to be dying. And that's what's happening to the church today. Many people in our age bracket wait till the bloody end when that's not the time. When do we need the help? When we first are ill and we know we're ill and we need the Lord's help. That's a good time to be anointed. Okay? So it, you, the younger people, please spread that because there is a lot of older people that don't understand that. I'm sorry, I have to get a little closer to here. Well, I don't mean to call you and I old. <laughs> right. Once a person has passed, once a person has passed, he is being cared by, by the Lord. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean we can't go in. In fact, you, you don't need the priest at that point. You can have the deacon come in and pray for those who have died. Okay, for the repose of the soul. And should never wait for that either. If, uh, in, uh, I've done it hundreds of times in the last 15 years. So. Besides being good, and, and you can do that. Every single one of you can do that. Pray for those who have died at the time they've died. Sorry. When and if we're ever allowed back in the hospitals again, hopefully soon. Extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion who take communion to the hospital, more often than not, may get called to provide viaticum food for the journey. Under normal conditions, you're bringing them Holy Communion. But if they're dying and you're the only one there, I'd rather have you as a Catholic and trained and understanding than to have a Protestant chaplain who I, I have great respect for them but they don't really understand the sacrament. Okay? Make sense? So the chief biblical text concerning the right is addressed in James. Um, James uh, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And basically, he says, is among you the sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, where in there does it say they're checking out? Okay. And the sacrament is also again dressed in Mark chapter 10, Luke 10, and Mark 6. I really encourage you to look those up. Likewise, I, look, I encourage you to look this up in the, uh, uh, the uh, our um, Catholic, uh, it, a number of our Catholic books in regards to Catholic Catechism of the Church and so on. Okay? So there is a status involved, and a lot of people get confused because we'll have the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Coptic, the Old Catholic Churches, which are all uh, in sync with the, with the Roman Catholic Church. 
And they all consider this to be a sacrament, a very special sacrament instituted by Christ. Other Christians also, Anglicans and Lutherans, and some other Protestants use a rite of anointing of the sick, but don't classify it as a sacrament. Okay? It's not the same. In the churches mentioned here by name, the oil used is called the oil of the sick in both the West and the East, and it's blessed specifically during Holy Week by the bishop for that diocese for this purpose. Okay? Any burning questions? The graces of the sacrament. Anointing of the sick is one of the seven sacraments. And it's associated not only with bodily healing, but with forgiveness of sins. You see the crossover, independence and confession? Only priests can administer it, and any priest can carry the oil with them. And most of them do carry the oil with them at all times. So that in case of necessity, he can administer the sacrament of anointing of the sick. Okay? And the reason only a priest can do that is because a deacon cannot do that because of its relationship to penance. Okay? That's a simplified theological explanation. But because of that relationship, only a priest does that. The uniting of a, a sick person to the passion of Christ is one of the graces. It's for his own good and that of the whole church. It provides us strength and peace and courage to endure in a Christian manner the suffering of illnesses or old age. I have never been with someone who's been anointed that didn't feel some relaxation and spiritual um, calmness come about them. And everyone I've ever spoke to has said the same thing. And if anybody here has ever been anointed in a communal anointing, uh, they will probably tell you the same thing. The forgiveness of sins if the sick person was not able to obtain it through the sacrament of penance. So if a person is not capable of, of giving a confession, which is, often occurs, the sacrament or the anointing of the sick in this situation forgives the sins. And of course what we all play for is the restoration of health if it is conducive to the salvation of the individual's soul. Because a person is anointed, it's God's decision. Okay? And then it's a preparation for uh, passing over to eternal life. Any, any thoughts or questions there? I went through that pretty quick. Well, I must be a whole lot better than I thought I was. <laughs> Sacrament of penance. Um, I'm going to give you something really quick here first. I would also, at this point, like to ask you to bow your heads again one more time for a, a prayer. A prayer for the joy of forgiveness. Heavenly Father, through the obedience of Jesus, who offered his life in the service of all, help me with your kindness. Make me strong through the Eucharist. May I put into action the saving mystery I celebrate in the Mass. Protect me with your love and prepare me for eternal happiness. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar, but I want, I want to read something to you. One of the big questions that always comes up is scriptural references when you're talking with someone outside of the church. And it's very, very clear. We've all heard it, I don't know how many times, in gospel readings and mass. From John 20, verses 20 verse 23. And Jesus says, Who sins you forgive, 
are forgiven and whose sins you retain are retained. Now you'll hear many people that try to justify those words. But if we, the, the big statement that you make is if you believe scripture, even those who are scripture and scripture only, then why would you try to change it? This is what Jesus told us. Those sins who you forgive are forgiven, and those sins who you retain are retained. But we find that confession is pretty important. How many are, are you, of you are just completing sacraments? How many are full RCIA candidates? Okay, so I'm going to miss, some of you may not quite understand the question, but do you want Eucharist to change your life? Do you? Do you really want Eucharist to change your life? If we really want Eucharist to change our life, we can celebrate through this whole year, and this year in particular because it is the year of the Eucharist, as the people of God. And to do so, what we do is only look to the saints who have gone before us. Seeing how the Eucharist itself changed their lives offers us a pattern and how we can change our lives. You see, the saints saw an intimate, vital connection between the Eucharist and the sacrament of reconciliation. Part of the greatest preparation we can make to receive Christ's body and blood worthily and fruitfully is to experience his forgiveness and healing in confession. Would everybody agree with that? It's difficult at times, and I understand that. Well, let's back up here. The sacrament of penance. If we think about what I just spoke to you about, it's a conversion. It's a sacrament of conversion. It's getting ourselves right. It's also the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of confession, the sacrament of forgiveness, and it's the sacrament of reconciliation. And you'll hear confession called every single one of these. Okay? But all of them are good, and they all say the same thing. These are names for the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. And that's taken right out of the, the catechism of the Catholic Church, of 1423 to 1425. So what's the penance definition? Your textbook, or not your textbook, but te different textbooks, different theme books, will tells us that penance is an action of Christ. In fact, it uses an example, most theologians use it as an example, that the good shepherd goes out to rescue lost sheep. That's the most common example. Truly, this is a sign of the good shepherd. What we are called to look at is to look at ourselves like sheep. And that Christ's action is about rescuing us from our sinfulness. Now we know that the Good Shepherd loves us no matter what we have done. And unlike us, unlike us um, we find it, we, we as individuals find it hard to forgive. But God forgives us because he loves us. In fact, he does so over and over and over again because he loves us. So why would we be afraid of it? It's so common. Why? Why would we be afraid of that? Penance, has, like I said, has come to mean the outward acts by which sorrow is shown for sin. And the sacrament was instituted for the remission of sins committed after baptism. God alone can forgive our sins, not the priest. Okay? God alone forgives our sins. But he has made the priests his representative. 
Il persona Cristo. In the person of Christ, that priest is there. It's not God doing it. God, it's not the priest doing it. It's God doing it. Okay? I can guarantee you that 99, well, probably 990 times out of 1,000, once a person leaves the confessional, the priest has no recollection. It's between you and God. He may offer some good advice. He may offer some thoughts or ideas. He may assign you to read a chapter or two of something. I mean, if it's been offered for me or been instructed, if I've been instructed to do it, it could come up. <laughs> okay. And then finally, in order to partake of the graces of the sacrament, we only need one thing, and that's to be truly sorry for the sins that we've committed and be ready to confess them and to be ready to make some act of satisfaction for them. Does that all make sense? I tell children, and maybe maybe this is a little bit out of line, I'm not trying to um, make make it less than what it is. But when I'm talking to children, I explain it like this. If mommy has told you to take out the garbage and you don't take out the garbage, have you done something wrong? And of course the answer they will come back is yes. I said, now if mommy catches you in the living room as you're headed out the door to play and she says, did you take out the garbage? And you say yes, then what? You've committed a sin in this text, okay? You've lied to mom. Now, once you've lied to mom, how difficult is it to tell her the truth? We all remember that. It gets more and more difficult. And as we stack up those stories, it gets even more and more difficult. So the best time to make a confession is when we need to do it, not wait. I've given a lot of special seminars on the sacrament of penance, which goes a great deal longer than this. And I talk to people and they'll say, well, I haven't been to confession in 15 years. Now, we could go through a lot of stuff that I've already spoken about. And basically, teasing them, I'll say, I hope you kept a notebook or two, you know, which is not necessary. But... The idea is once, once a person doesn't go on a regular basis, it becomes more and more difficult to go. Okay? And that's what we're speaking about here. If we do something and we are sorry for it, then we need, we need to take care of it and not wait. Remembering it's between you and God, and God has placed the priest as his representative. I read you a little bit of scripture at the beginning. Matthew 2, verses 2 through 8. The Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Whose sins you forgive are retained or forgiven. And just before that, he breathes on them, receive the Holy Spirit, which is in reference to this whole section on confession. 2 Corinthians speaks to giving us the ministry of reconciliation. And then in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, is a prayer of presbyters or priests for forgiveness of sins. Thoughts? So the parts of reconciliation... We'll hear a number of terms being tossed down. One, of course, is contrition. And contrition is the eternal attitude of sorrow. I am deeply sorry for having offended you, O Lord. So it's a, it's a, it's a deep attitude of sorrow and repentance. Like with the children, I'd say, I am deeply sorry, Mom, but I did lie to you. I didn't take the garbage out. And on top of that, I didn't take it out in the first place. So you got me twice. Okay. Confession. The penitent is called to clearly tell of the sin for which absolution is requested. Many people will say, well, I don't need to have a priest. I can just do that privately. 
But unless you're willing to vocalize to the Lord through his presbyters, how are you really showing your contrition? So the way we do that is really own up and say, we have made this major mistake. Now, does that mean you have to keep a list of every major mistake you made in the last two weeks? No. But those who are bothering you, you probably ought to see confession about them. Absolution. The act emphasizes the healing power of Jesus. It's not the priest. It's the healing power of Jesus through his presbyters. Okay? And then satisfaction. The act of absolution through penance. Reforming one's life or amending for their sins. <clears throat> and this, of course, is where you'll hear some people will as, as teens, my, my wife used to tell me they, they had seven kids in her family and they would compare. Well, I got two Hail Marys and three Our Fathers, or I got this. Or I got... So they were trying to figure out who was the worst out of the seven based on what they got. But that's not what it's about. Uh, it's amending and, and really thinking about how do I correct this? What do I need to do that? I can tell you personally, I went to confession once with... Uh, a spiritual director. Actually, it was uh, I was ordained, and I was kind of disturbed because a lot of things were going on, and I just couldn't quite get a handle on everything. It was kind of driving me nuts. <laughs> and I explained that to him, and he looked at me for a long time, and I knew what he was thinking. He said, "Where's the real sin? Everybody gets, you know, we're, we get from there." It, what he did. My absolution is he made me give up my cell phone for three days, told me to go to a movie, buy a bag of popcorn and watch a movie and forget everything else for a while. You know, And that's probably the best thing he could have done for me. Um, so priests are, are really knowledgeable. They understand. I'm not saying that you would get that kind of penance out of Father Ed. Don't, and don't tell him that I said you would. But I am saying that they have a great deal to offer, a great deal of knowledge and a great deal of love, okay? And the worst thing we can do is not take advantage of it. There is a case of valid administration. The sacrament is a means of grace, so it has to be valid. It's not going to be valid if you come see me. Now, as a cop for 25 years, I heard a lot of confessions, but I didn't forgive anybody. I took them straight to jail, okay? Um, Sacrament is a means of grace. Christ intends graces for all, I put it up there, men, all men and women, okay? Men in this case means everybody. Forgiving sins must continue until the very end of time, going on forever. It has been handed on to the apostles uh, and to their successors and to the bishops and then on to the priests. Been around for a long time. For this reason, the character of the priesthood is required in order to meet the needs of jurisdiction, to meet the needs of making it valid administration. Okay. Requirements of penance, like we talked about, is contrition. And contrition is an act which may be perfect or imperfect. Can anybody tell me what the difference is? What would be perfect contrition? A bit deep down in, you got the answer. Hmm? Okay. Perfect contrition is an act which we... Perfect contrition is we... We change because we love God, okay? Imperfect contrition, we change because we're scared to death of it. You see the difference? That's very simple terms. Contrition is an act which we may be, may be perfect or imperfect. And contrition is an act of will where the penitent turns away from sin, uh, detests it, regrets that he committed it, uh, and is resolved to make satisfaction for it and to avoid it in the future. Okay, to avoid all sin, at least all mortal sins. That's the commitment we're making. 
We know we're going to make little boo-boos along the line, but we're going to make every effort to avoid that, especially the mortal sins. To shun the approximate occasion of sin to use means which are necessary for our amendment. If a person has a problem, let's say a person has a drinking problem. Well, probably the last place he ought to stop by to have a cup of tea is in a bar. So you would avoid that place. That's a simple thing. Okay? Uh, so what we do is we avoid those occasions that draw us into sin. To do our penance and to repair as far as possible the injury caused by our sin. If we've hurt other people, we may be asked to approach them and tell them that we're sorry. If we have only venial sins, we must uh, firmly resolve to avoid or lessen the number. I don't like that statement, lessen the number, and I'll tell you why. What happens if we commit too many venial sins? Venial sin can lead right into a mortal sin. It becomes a habit to the point where you could actually commit a mortal sin. And that's why, actually, the statement, lessen the number of avoid, we should try to avoid them as much as possible. Okay? So the necessity of confession. We must, we must confess to be forgiven. If we cannot confess... It's pretty impossible to be forgiven. We're not willing to own up to it. It's not going to happen. Christ, remember that Christ said, whose sins are, are uh, you shall forgive are forgiven them, and those sins that you retain shall be retained. And confession has always been used in the church of God. Even in Acts uh, 9, I put in there, many of those who became believers came forward and openly acknowledged their former practices. And St. John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just so as to forgive our sins. So what, in essence, what does this all mean? Well, it means don't be afraid. Thanks to God, our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the sacrament of reconciliation precisely to heal the rupture with God that we may have created as weak individuals. Now, one of the ways we make a call or make a good confession is a complete examination of conscience. And that can be done a number of different ways. Normally, like I said, in and over the next two sessions, I'm going to talk about the Ten Commandments in, in a way probably you've not heard before, but it's a way of examining uh, who we are, what we are, and how we're doing. Uh, a few weeks back, I talked about the corporal works of mercy, which are all good things to look at in examination of conscience. But the Ten Commandments is where we probably really need to start, a lot of us. One must complete an examination of conscience, and one must confess all mortal sins sincerely, Clearly and completely. One must complete the penitential works imposed by the confessor on the penitent. And after worthy reception of the sacrament of penance, some punishment still may do, be due for our sins. Still may be due. Now look. You always have the option to go to confession anonymously. The pandemic is creating a little different situation right now. But you always have the option under normal conditions to go anonymously. That is behind a screen or face to face. It's your desire, what you prefer. Right now, the pandemic has made it a little bit different because we have all kinds of rules okay, to keep you safe and healthy. After the priest greets you in the name of Christ, we make the sign of the cross, and he may actually re re uh, choose to recite at that time uh, a reading from Scripture, after which you say, simply, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been one day, one week, one month, 
one year since my last confession. These are my sins. Okay. Do you need to give a, a full long list? No. But certainly go through the ones that most bother an individual. And tell your sins simply and honestly. You might even want to, to discuss the circumstances in the root. That's between you and your confessor. And listen to the advice. We've talked about that. And the priest will dismiss you with the words, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And you respond, for his mercy endures forever. It's the most beautiful sacrament there is. And you walk away, I swear, you walk away floating on clouds for at least a day, maybe, if you're lucky. Okay? Always spend some time with the Lord, thanking him and praising him for his gift and mercy. So, like I said, no one to versus anonymous, greeting by the confessor, acknowledgement by the penitent of the state of sin to confessor, that's you telling him I goofed, stating the sins. Confessor gives advice or suggestions or ideas on how to avoid it in the future. An act of contrition, and there's a couple of different acts of contrition available. Uh, and then the priest dismissal. And complete the assigned penance. And then always, we always want to spend time with the Lord, thanking him for his graciousness. I have a number of different, I'm going to skip over those because I'm running out of time. But prayers. Be, there's a prayer before confession I do want to go over. And I would ask everybody, once it quits fiddling around there, because I got crazy one day. Everybody to join in with me. O oh, merciful God, prostrate at your feet, I implore your forgiveness. I sincerely desire to leave all my faults and to confess my sins with all sincerity to you, your priest. I am a sinner. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Give me a lively faith and a firm hope in the passion of my Redeemer. Give me, for your mercy's sake, a sorrow for having offended so good a God. Mary, my mother, refuge of sinners, praise for me that I may make a good confession. Amen. One of the reasons I really love that, again, we go right back to our Holy Mother to ask her to intercede for us if we maybe goofed up a little too much. <laughs> and then there's a couple acts of contrition, and I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to skip through those. So a contrition is the sorrow of the soul and hatred for the sin committed, uh, together with a resolution not to sin again. Contrition is the most important act of the penitent and is necessary uh, for the reception of the sacrament of penance. I've been asked previously if a priest may not give uh, forgiveness. And one of the ways that they will judge, they rare as it ever happened, they did not. But if a person, if a penitent really did not seem to be fully contrite, that could possibility, uh, that possibility could occur. It is so rare, it's seldom ever has happened, but it does and it has. Okay. If, a, if they're just not, you know, I, I murdered somebody last week and the week before last, and then I've got two more on the list, you know. Sorry. Um, so here we go. Perfect contrition. Perfect contrition is defined, like I said, as if we are sorry for our sins because we love God. Sorrow of the soul and detestation for sin committed together with resolution not to sin again. And such uh, contrition remits venial sins. It also obtains forgiveness of mortal sins. It is, includes the firm resolution to sacramental confession. And then again, back to imperfect contrition. The text defines it, or theologians define it, as when we are sorry for our sins because we are afraid what God has said will happen to sinner. 
the gift of forgiveness is a gift from God. And that's the way we need to look at it. And what a precious gift it is. It means that we understand the ugliness of sin, but our conscience is stirred by our fear of God rather than our love of God. Not good. Not bad, but we should always be stirred by our love for God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that the sacrament's two essential elements are the human part through the action of the Holy Spirit and God's action through the intervention of the church. And so that's why we have these items. Okay? Finally, well, I shouldn't say finally, but the final outcome is that we are called to an interior conversion and repentance. It comes with beneficial pain and sadness, traditional called affliction of spirit and compunction. Otherwise, a repentance of heart. Our heart is repenting. Repentance, also called contrition, is perfect when it arises from our love. All of this is a work of God's grace, as spoken to in the Scripture. And through it, we recognize sorrow for sins, and we should always dread being uh, dread offending and being separated from God. Any thoughts? I got one more thing. When we looking at the Ten Commandments, and I'll probably mention this again this next week, one of the questions came up in the last session on the same class was two things. Our responsibility to children, okay, by part of our vocation that we talked about a few sessions back, we are called to educate our children, okay? And if we are failing to do that, then that's a shame on us, okay? Uh, which then puts us into the confession situation. Right. But um, one of the questions that came up last week as we were talking about some things, it, it, it always comes up. Someone said, well, what about attending Mass? Or I mentioned it or something. Attending Mass on Sundays and Holy, uh, holy Days of Obligation is a sin, not, not going. Now, obviously, if there's some reason you can't go, illness, church close, on vacation and you're 150 miles from the nearest parish or whatever. I mean, there's always some reason that, that could pass that up. But one of the most important things that we need to remember as parents is to call to mind the importance of the Mass, okay? And I want to clarify that that is the most important thing. We talked about the Eucharist in the beginning, but at, the, at this point, let's talk about the importance of the Mass. At Mass, we are fed with an abundance of graces. The Word of God, um, the Holy Catholic faith, and second, in a state of grace, have the opportunity to receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. So if we are good to go, or in a state of grace, because we made a confession just before Mass or whatever, we have the opportunity to receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Sharing in the Eucharist, the Lord's Day, becomes the day of the church where she can exercise her role as a sacrament of unity. So with that in mind, we need to think about attending Mass as fulfilling our... Um, no one should simply think about attending Mass as fulfilling an obligation. Oh, I'm Catholic. I have to go to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days. We shouldn't look at it as an ob obligation. We need to teach our children. We need to teach those who are closest to us. Don't look at it as an obligation. Look at it as privilege. Look at it as a gift. Okay? The Lord loves you and offers you this. Catholics should want to attend Mass. Mass offers us very precious gifts. A nourishment of great graces that every one of us uh, have the opportunity to partake in. It unites us with Holy Mother Church worldwide. 
And we have a sacred obligation to attend Mass. Remember the commandments? Keep holy the Sabbath. It didn't say, except for if you've got laundry to do, or you've got to go grocery shopping, or there's a football game on, keep holy the Mass. Keep the Sabbath holy. Sunday is the day on which the Paschal Mystery is celebrated in the light of a very old apostolic tradition and is to be observed as the foremost holy day of obligation in the universal church. So if we thumb our nose at that, we have committed a grievous sin. And those who fail, deliberately fail in this obligation, commit that grave sin. But again, that should not be our focus. Our focus should be that we have the opportunity to attend, not an obligation. We have the opportunity to attend and to take part in this grace. Okay? Questions? Too much for you? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'll get off my soapbox. How's that? All right. Let's all stand. And once again, going to our Holy Mother. Let's all pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, folks. Okay, let's just have a short break before we have the meeting. And for those parents or families watching, uh, please switch to Zoom and email will come at 7. Oh, it's, I think it's, it's in there now. Okay. Thank you.